Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to another episode of Living the Dream with Curveball, where I interview guests that motivate, teach, and inspire you to stop at nothing to fulfill your dreams. I'm your host, Curveball, and today we're going to be talking about substance abuse, recovery, and mental health. I am joined by Jay Schiffman. He is a speaker, a coach, and the host of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. So we're going to be talking about recovery, some statistics, and the struggle that he had to go through and why he is so passionate about this topic. Jay, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, I uh, I really appreciate you having me, and, and that was a great introduction. I got to tell you, man, I, I'm sure people tell you this all the time, but uh, from one host to another, you have, a, you have a fantastic podcast voice. Well, I graduated last year with academic excellence from broadcasting school. <laughs> that I'm doesn't also surprise internet, me at all. <laughs> also an internet radio DJ. Fantastic. I got to tune in, man. That would be, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. But well, let's let's make this all about you. Why don't you kind of give a little background about yourself? Let the audience know who you are. Yeah, I, so I'm a guy in long term recovery, first and foremost. That is that is sort of the understanding of everything I do. It, it comes from that perspective is I've been there. I, I've come back. And, you know, I really, I make sure that I, I, I never forget it. There's, there's, of course, a moving past it that, that, that happens. But uh, if, if, I guess being grounded in that experience and being tethered to, to understanding of what people are going through is, is really what allows me to do all that I do now and, and keep a distance, but at the same time, still have a little foot in there saying, I know, I know where you are. I've been there myself. and you know, trust me, you you can, you can get beyond this too. Speaking of being there, you definitely have been there because in your bio, you talk about how you survived two suicides and one overdose. So why don't you kind of walk people through what you say when you, what you mean when you say you've been there? Yeah, well, so the brief, the brief version of my story is that I uh, was misdiagnosed with an issue of mental health in my preteens or in my teens after a diagnosis of ADHD, essentially that the, the long, the long short of it is my therapist saw signs of what he thought was a larger issue. And in reality, it was just side effects from being on that medication mixed with the fact that I was a preteen and I was going through puberty and we all remember what that was like, right? And top of that, I'm a person who struggled with his mental health. And so some of these, you know, smaller issues all showed up together in one perfect storm as it was. And my therapist called that bipolar disorder. Now I didn't have bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is a very serious diagnosis of mental health uh, issue. But unfortunately I was put on medication for it anyways. And by my early twenties, I'd been on, I, I was uh, been on so many different medications and was currently taking so many different medications that I had cycled through the, 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 you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other of using these safely to misusing them and to finally having a, a an addiction to many of these medications. And, and at 23, I, I gave up hope. I decided that this wasn't going to get better, which would was the dumbest thing that I've ever thought. But, you know, when, when you, you've been getting worse for over a decade, I guess it's understandable. And attempted suicide twice in a two-day span. Uh, the second day, I went through an overdose. I clearly survived that overdose and, and spent the next almost six months between a lockdown facility, which is, you know, exactly what you see on TV. No shoelaces, no belt, that kind of thing. And finally, a long-term care facility, what we would have called mental institution 50 years ago. And it was there that I got to know people with bipolar, you know, people who really were struggling with that. And I said, you know, that doesn't look like what I'm going through. And then I met people who were struggling with, with substance misuse and with addiction. And I said, that I recognize, that looks familiar. And so I pledged to get off all these medications and 
in the spring of 2010, I, I after four months of, of step down detox, which is a very trying experience of detox, that's what I did. And, and for the first time in over a decade, I had nothing in my system. Well, I have a two part question for you. The first part is how often do you think in mental health that these professionals misdiagnose people? And the second part is explain your step down detox program. So if anybody is thinking about doing it or may need it, they can understand what you mean when you say it's trying. Both wonderful questions. The first one is something that I talk about a lot and, and misdiagnosis is, is a part of, of any, you know, medical interaction, right? Because they're doctors, they're, 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 they're human. They, they make mistakes. Now, what's scary is that perfect example. I love to use this, this example. My, my aunt recently went through a fight with cancer. She's doing much better now, but for every step of the way, she got second, third, fourth, fifth opinions. That's common when it comes to our physical health. We always get at least a second opinion. It's just standard practice. Now, when it comes to mental health, that is not standard practice. In fact, it's very rare. My story is not unique. There are people who go through what I went through all the time. And it's partly because we just don't get a second opinion when it comes to our mental health. And, and, and you know, that's very startling, especially in a situation like mine, where my therapist literally diagnosed me with, you know, the mental health equivalent of cancer. The, the bipolar disorder is a very serious issue. And we believed him right off the bat. No, no questions asked. So that is a message I like to, to tell a lot, which is if you get it, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. It can be something as, you know, commonplace as ADHD. Go get another opinion you know don't be afraid of offending your therapist go go to another one and say hey you know my therapist just diagnosed me with this can i get your opinion on this and and you know see what they say and and it showed up in my treatment because when i was in the long-term care facility i've actually i i got a lawyer on my side and got all my records or at least the records that i was able to to find and I've read my treatment notes and the doctors there did not agree with my therapist. They didn't think I had bipolar disorder. They had no idea what I had, but they did not think I had bipolar disorder. And and I wish instead of asking that question, you know, five years later, I had asked it that day, you know, thank you so much for that diagnosis. That's very scary. Let me go talk to somebody else and I'll be back with you. That didn't happen. So, so that is my answer to your question is that it, it it's not that it's common. It's not that it's uncommon. It's that we really don't know because there's not enough people that are that are doing this common sense idea of getting a second opinion. And to your second question, a step down detox is the opposite of the, the common parlance we all know as cold turkey. So unfortunately, I was on so many different medications that I couldn't go cold turkey, which is where you just stop and, and you let your body heal. If I had done that, the combined withdrawal, I was at this point, I was on six different medications, one of which I was taking more than what they thought was a lethal dosage, of this drug. And if I had just stopped, my body would have gone into such a state of withdrawal, I would have died. So step down is very common. It's just, a, it just isn't as well known. And what it means is you take a little bit less of the drug every day until it's out of your system. And in my case, because I was on so many, Doing that took almost four months because I would focus on drug A and it would take three weeks to get that out of my system. Then I would move to drug B and some were quicker than others. And, and I had a doctor advising me, a therapist, a, a psychiatrist who was advising me on how quickly I could, I could go through this, but it was painful in every sense of the word. I was, I was in agony, both physically, mentally, my brain was going haywire because my body was, was screaming at it all the time, you know, sort of uh, in, in solely, I was just felt terrible. I, I felt hopeless. So it was a, a very trying period. And I'm very lucky that I was living at the time with my grandmother in, in Arizona. And my grandmother is my biggest cheerleader, my best friend, uh, still is to this day. And she was there. She was waiting on me hand and foot like a nurse. I mean, there were days I couldn't get out of bed, other days where I could. And, and if it wasn't for her, I don't know if I would have got through it. In your bio, you talk about statistics of people who suffer from mental health and substance misuse. 
kind of go over those and and give an overview of the statistics that you have found with this issue? Yeah. So I will say right off the bat, the easiest answer to that is that there, it's way higher than you would think. Before COVID, and I'll, and I'll get to COVID in a second, but before COVID, different estimates were somewhere between one in four and one in five people in this country would at some point struggle with an issue of mental health. And those, those estimates, the reason that they're different is that it depends on if you include things like substance misuse or addiction. Some places count that as an issue of mental health. Some places don't. Of course, now we know that the, it's very close to 100% of people who struggle with addiction also have an underlying or concurrent behavioral health issue. So it's, it's kind of silly to separate the two. So, so I tend to believe before COVID that that number was at least 25% if not higher. That being said, COVID completely changed the landscape. And and in fact, there were some people that were estimating some really respected researchers who were estimating that at least as high as one in two people were struggling with their mental health at some point during COVID. And it's because for the first time you know, ever, a lot of people were, were kind of waking up to what anxiety felt like. And so you had people going, oh, my God, is this what anxiety is? Is this what, you know, somebody living with an a, a anxiety disorder goes through every day? This is horrible. And, and it and so one of those sort of unintended consequences is there's been a lot of writing on people thinking, well, is it possible that there's going to be a lot more empathy for mental health going forward? Because people are going to be able to think back and go, oh, man, I remember what that felt like when I was going through that during COVID. So it, that is something that a lot of us are kind of sitting back and waiting, waiting for or watching for. And I will say just, you know, this is my own you know, uh, personal experience on this. I obviously take that with the grain of salt because it's literally just mine. I think it's already happening. I think, I think we can look around us and we can see a shift taking place in leading with more empathy for issues of mental health. And, and, and it's because so many people just went through this traumatic experience and that trauma is affecting them. And so they're able to look around and go, Oh my God, like, you know, I, I definitely feel more of a kinship with that person because I know what that's like. You talk about the system needs to change. There are things that need to change in the system to deal with these issues. Can you talk about what those, what do you think that needs to change to be able to better deal with mental health and substance misuse? hundred percent. So the easiest answer, there's a lot, (laughs) you and I could do a whole podcast just on that question and still not cover all of it. But the easy answer right off the bat is during the, the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, part of that law was what was called mental health parity. And, and very, you know, sort of surface level, what that means is that we are supposed to be able to see a mental health clinician to the same extent that we can see a physical health clinician under our insurance plans. Straight, that does not happen. And the reason it does not happen is that the insurance companies do not want to pay for it. And our legislators have not once held them to that law. The law passed in 2000, what was that, 2011? And, and from day one, it was very clear our legislators were going to ignore the fact that they had just passed this law. So the easy answer is it's already there. All we have to do is hold them to it. And, and what that would look like, perfect example, is my current insurance plan. I can only see a therapist once a quarter under their plan. And yet I could go to my doctor once a month and it's covered. That makes no sense. It should be the opposite of anything, but, but, you know, by this law, it should be, it should be equal. So that's the, the easiest answer is that we got to hold insurance companies accountable to the law that was already passed. And that means asking our legislators to do that because they were the ones that passed the law. So that's number one. Number two is the treatment system. This is more focusing on on substance misuse and and addiction. The treatment system is just flat out broken. And and there's a lot of different theories as to why that happened. There's a lot of different ideas about how to fix it. But everyone agrees, or those of us who, who do this work, all agree the system is broken. And it's broken for a couple different ways. Number one, most of the places do not take insurance at all. Just no insurance. 
If they do, it's it, it runs out very quickly. And and again, that's more on the insurance, but the the but the the system is okay with that because that means that you're paying out of pocket, and that's going to be more more money for them anyways. So number one is the cost. You know, the average in, the the average treatment center can cost around thirty thousand a month, which is just ridiculous. Number two, most of these places do not use scientifically proven treatment methods. And that would be shocking if you, if that was anything else, can you imagine a cancer doctor who was like, eh, we're not going to do chemo. And, and you know what, if you, if you believe we should do chemo, that's fine. We just don't do that here. That's basically where we are with treatment. In fact, 80% of treatment centers in this country do not use the, the medical system for their treatment. They do only AA style 12 step treatment. Now there is nothing wrong with AA. There's nothing wrong with 12-step style treatment. In concert with medication, in concert with therapy, it works very well. It does not work very well alone. In fact, when it comes to substances other than alcohol, which is, you know, what AA was founded on, it's literally in its name, Alcoholics Anonymous. Other substances, the success rate for AA is under 10%. In fact, the last time that anyone did a study on this, they found it to be roughly 8% of people who, who used AA to get off of something other than alcohol succeeded in staying in recovery. That is abysmal. And yet that's what 80% of our treatment centers use, which is just ridiculous. So those are the two very surface level. And when I say that the system needs to change, I mean overhaul, right? And it, we got to get a better insurance plan in this country. And I think that kind of means moving away from our, our current you know, privatized insurance. And then we have to overhaul the, the treatment system. And a lot of people, the ones that I subscribe to, at least the ones that I follow, are saying the way to do that is by rolling it back into the healthcare system altogether. Why are treatments separate? You know, why is it that you can't go to a doctor? doctor and get information on treatment. It's, it doesn't make any sense for it to be a separate industry. It should be part of our medical system. Well, let's talk about your Choose Your Struggle podcast. Tell us about that. Tell us about where we can listen and, and the type of show it is and the people you talk to. Well, I started the podcast in January of 2020, and, and I did so because I was looking around and reading the writing on the wall, and, and it became very clear, as, as you know, eventually happened, that it was going to be a struggle to to do what I normally do in the year 2020, and that is my background is in public speaking. That that's sort of my bread and butter. And in fact, in, in early March, when when the NBA canceled, we all remember that as being the real like, oh my god, this COVID thing is really you know going to get crazy. I lost five speaking engagements in two days. And I was like, oh my God, like this year is going to be really tough. But before that, I started, you know, looking around and going, how can I still have an impact when this year is, is as shut down as it looks like it's going to be? And right before that, my best friend, who's a comedian in, in Chicago by the name of Spark Tabor, he started a podcast. And I had literally said the week before he started his podcast to a coaching client. I said, man, I will never start a podcast. This was a client who was like, you'd be really good at this. You should do this. I was like, ah, man, I'm just not going to do that. Like, that's not going to happen. Podcast based in Chicago, like I said. And I was like, you know, dude, I love you. You know, you've been my best friend since seventh grade. If you can do this, I can do this. <laughs> and so I started my podcast, but actually, who I thought were doing incredible work. These were people that uh, work in these industries. And in some cases are people that I know, advocates in the systems and stuff like that. And so I, I then was, I, I got feedback from a listener who said, no offense, man, but, but as a white guy, if you're talking about substance misuse and recovery without talking about the way this country treats drug users, you know, and in and, and, and talking about drug policy, that's kind of a white privilege for you. And, and, and it really took me aback at first. And then I went, wow, you are so right. And what was so interesting about that is that I'm a person, I've been arrested for paraphernalia and possession back, you know, this is 20 years, almost 20 years ago. And, 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 you know, I've seen firsthand from working with people struggling through addiction, what this country does to those who use drugs, who, who struggle with uh, substance misuse and recovery. 
And yet I had overlooked this fact that that you cannot talk about this without talking about drug use and policy. And so I added that to my my podcast as well. And, and it was after that that the, it really started to take off. I started bringing in people like, you know, representatives of Drug Policy Alliance and the, the Brookings Institute in, in, in D.C., you know, incredible, motivating and, and inspirational people around these issues. The, the, the real big name, I guess the, the highest high of last season, which ended in November, was I brought in Katie Hill, which is a former, she's a former Congress member who went through a very traumatic experience while, while in Congress. We talked about that. And, and so the season ended on a really high note. Everything was going great. And I re-kicked it off in January for season two. Um, and it's just been, it's been fantastic. I, I'm so thankful for all my listeners. So thankful for all the people who continue wanting to talk. I get to, to talk to some really, uh, really inspiring people, people that, that I've looked up to for years are now suddenly knocking on my door saying, Hey, I would love to come on your podcast and get the word out. That's, that's really, you know, it, it, it makes me super happy that I have been able to work hard enough and, and double and, and really spend the time on this thing uh, that these people that I look up to are now looking at me as a guy that that they wanted to do this work with and you know I, I i am humble about that i'm grateful for that and i definitely am not in any way you know saying that that this is like as high as i want this thing to go but at the same time i'm always i always want to make sure that i'm grounded enough to keep talking to the people that make me excited which are the everyday people who are struggling with this these issues well, I definitely want to congratulate you on your success. Do you have any projects or any upcoming speaking engagements or anything else that people need to know about that you're working on? Well, I do actually. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. So I, I, I speaking is starting to open up again, which I'm very happy about. I, my, my first, my first post COVID event is coming up at the beginning of June. I will be vaccinated and ready to go. I'm very excited. But but the one so so I guess to finish that thought, if if people are looking for someone to talk about issues of mental health, substance misuse and recovery or drug use and policy, and that includes the history of the drug war in this country, which is something I'm I'm very excited to talk about. Hit me up. I would love to talk to you. Bring you know, I've talked to groups as small as you know people's living rooms, all the way up to you know multiple hundreds, thousand people in a in a conference hall. So very excited to educate and, and have vulnerable conversations around those issues. I do currently host two events besides my podcast. One is called Rock Bottom Storytellers. It is once a quarter live event online in which four people tell their rock bottom story in a vulnerable way. Those th That event is meant to you know, really help end the stigma around these issues and build empathy around struggle and, and help normalize just talking about struggle. So that's number one. And the other one is called A Day in the Life. It's a storytelling event that I do online as well. This one's one-on-one. -on -one. It's me introducing somebody who has a fantastic story. They then tell that story. And by the way, this is a story I haven't heard yet. That's part of the joy of this is that I'm reacting the same way that the, the audience is. And then I come back at the end and interview them about this story, ask them the questions that just sort of come up to my mind about it. And we chat for another 10 to 15 minutes that way. So those are a lot of fun. The, the, they're both, uh, they're both online right now, although it's my dream in the post COVID world to, to bring them to a stage. But for the moment, at least you can find them at my Facebook page, at my, see, they're on Facebook, they're on Twitter and they're on YouTube. Just go to my website, jshiffman.com and, and go to the links there and you can subscribe to whatever Wherever you want to subscribe to follow me wherever you want to follow me and 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 you'll uh you'll you'll catch those events perfect you just got my next question to give out your contact info so do you have any final thoughts before we close it out for the audience well, number one, I appreciate you having me. I, I will always talk about these issues they're that important to me as someone who's been there, but I make sure that i i Say the same message whenever I speak. Number one, as I always said, always get a second opinion. I, 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 that's sort of my own personal pet peeve because I didn't do that as a teenager. But you know, it's just a, it's just a common sense thing that we overlook when it comes to mental health. But number two, and most importantly, and I, and I really mean that most importantly always reach out, whether you're someone who is struggling and you feel like there's nobody that wants to be there for you or the opposite. If there's somebody in your life who you're worried about, the answer is always reach out. Don't be afraid to have a hard conversation. 
And, and I always offer this up whenever I'm interviewed, whenever I speak, if you're hearing this and you say, well, that's well and good, but there's nobody in my life that would listen to me. Number one, again, take it from a guy who also thought that and, and attempted suicide twice. I, I can't tell you how many people reached out to me afterwards. Like, I'm kind of angry at you that you wouldn't talk to me, you know? So that's number one. But number two, I always offer this. If you truly believe that there's nobody in your life who wants to listen to you, reach out to me. Again, find me at my website, jshiffman.com. Those of us who do this work, we have a saying, and that is we'd rather spend two hours listening to you today than two hours at your funeral tomorrow. And I mean that. I've had people reach out to me through, seriously, through TikTok. Every social media that you can imagine, people have reached out to me. People have called me. People have emailed, tech, whatever. Reach out. And just even if you just say hi, Listen, I get it. I've been there. I, I will know how to respond. We'll have a conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, Jay Schiffman, jschiffman.com website will be in the show notes. Please be sure to follow, rate, review, and share after listening. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream. dream.